Okay. Let's get started. What is this? All in So this is um, a session on uh, PolyDeploy. It's the uh, deployment solution that we've come up with for DNN. Um, and basically, we're going to go over um, why we thought it was necessary, what the problems that we were seeing were, how PolyDeploy worked, and how it's, um, how it's solved some of those problems for us. Uh, so I've been working with DNN for about five years, a company called Cantaris. I assume most people have heard of us. Uh, uh, the, over the last couple of years, um, and I've basically worked with DNN as a developer, and then as a, later on as a consultant, and now I'm running the, the team that is working on our our products, our modules that we put out to our clients, and also on our tooling. So this is where this has come out of. Okay, so we essentially found the deployment process for DNN uh, to be overly cumbersome in terms of not being able to use it properly with CI and CD, it, it doing manual deployments, taking a long time, being very error prone, um, and that's even uh, back in the back in the old days where you could have just have the run the install wizard, on mode install resources, put everything in the install folder, press go, and it would install everything. Sometimes it wouldn't run the SQL upgrades properly. Sometimes you, it wouldn't install everything properly, and you wouldn't it'd be very difficult to get any. Uh, formatting out of that. So PolyDeploy, it aims to provide basically secure, reliable, and audible deployments to all your different environments. So as I said, until fairly recently, you could be able to use the, um, the bulk multiple installation tool uh, in the install installation folder. Um, and most people, I assume, in this room are used to doing that. Um, as I said, it's not, it wasn't 100% reliable. Obviously, in 2016, there were security issues with that. The DNN's official recommendation was to remove all those files for any production web servers. Uh, what happened in practice, at least for us, is if we had to do big deployments, we had sites that had 20, 30 modules on it, um, we'd copy those files back in, run the installation with them, and get rid of them again. And there were times where you know those files were left there. You ended up with a security vulnerability. They were never uh, exploited, but the, we weren't happy with that area of our process. So we started stopping that pro that um, process and instead trying to do everything manually, uh, which is obviously going through the installation wizard, installing modules one at a time. Doing that on a life site, you've got increased downtime, doing multiple app pool refreshes, more failed deployments. We've got certain solutions if you deploy stuff in the wrong order. It, then you've got clashing um, SQL for providers, for instance. And basically, there's increased disruption and a crappy dev experience with people going through the installation with 10, 20 times while under pressure to get a live deployment out. So this is what we wanted to achieve with uh, PolyDeploy before it was even called PolyDeploy when we were just like, we need to fix our deployment processes. Mm -hmm. We want it to be stress-free, um, one click if possible, um, secure, <laughs> decrease the amount of downtime that we're seeing on a live site so we can get it back up and, and get users using it again. We wanted to integrate it with our continuous deployment and continuous integration processes. And also we wanted an auditable uh, platform. So if someone's deploying, we want to know who it is, where they're deploying from, what they deployed, all of that information. So we came up with uh, PolyDeploy. PolyDeploy is, is just a, a DNN extension, but it can be used in multiple different ways. So uh, obviously, it's got its standard view. You can go to the website. It essentially replaces the, um, the installation wizard, or it has done for us in the, in the past. Um, or you, there's a, a local client. There's a command line interface where you can just say, here are all my modules. Go and install them. And it'll do it straight from the command line, which is it's really useful, actually, for our devs, because they're obviously doing deployments all the time to dev sites, to test sites, to make sure things work in different environments. And they can just have all their setup, 
run a deployment, and then it's instantly there after an app pull refresh. So the interface, which I'll show you in the brief demo in a bit, um, is host only, so it's very much the same as the extension wizard, uh, and includes management settings for uh, generating API keys for all your different users. It's how you uh, specify what IPs you want to whitelist, etc. Um, as I said, it, it replaces the, that installation wizard. Um, the installation wizard is still there, but we normally replace it in terms of having this module there. And the deployment client, as I said, is, is the command line version of that uh, that can be used either remotely or locally. It, does, it doesn't matter. So one of the key features of Polydeploy is it does all your dependency resolution. So as I said, if we've got complicated solutions with uh, 15, 20, 30, however many modules in it uh, that are all interdependent on each other, um, it will work out what order they need to be installed based on their DNA manifest. So it will, if we take a quick example, which is entirely derived, we've got E that depends on A and Z, and they both depend on uh, T. It will then scan their manifest at upload time and basically take them in order and say which ones need to uh, be installed first, and it will go through the create a, a stack of uh, the inst actual installation order so you don't get any of those dependency issues that we've seen in other places. And eventually, all of these modules will end up in that install order on the left, in the right order. <coughs> Security is a key, um, a key uh, aspect of our approach to PolyDeploy. So we've, we've tried to do it in like a, a belt and braces kind of way where we're using lots of different security mechanisms to make sure that the, the overall process is secure. So not only have we got each individual user has their own API key, they've also got their own secret encryption key that encrypts all the traffic uh, so it can't be tampered with while it's being uploaded. Um, IP whitelisting, so by default when you install it on, the, uh, on the, the server, you can only access it through the server, and that's the UI, that's the client, that's everything until you whitelist the IP that you want. And it's only uh, accessible to host users and also, it's, uh, it does some package analysis to make sure that the DLLs you're actually uploading are the ones that are specified in the manifest. So even if you have someone that's tampered with an installation package, it will not allow any of those DLLs to be uploaded into your bin. So let's talk a little bit about how the uh, dual key authentication works. So each user is provided with an API key. Um, and that's through the, the management interface, and uh, an encryption key as well. So this is only shown to the user once, uh, a generation time. It's then obfuscated from that point on. It's obfuscated in the database. Um, and if, if they lose that, then they have to regenerate it, which is not a costly process. It's like two clicks. But The user then configures their deployment client with their keys. So if you're using the command line client, as I'll show you in a bit later, there's uh, essentially areas where you put those API keys and encryption keys into the client and th in, a, in a configuration file. Then the encryption key is used to encrypt all the uh, packages that are going to be sent to the server. And uh, the installation, sorry. Yeah, the, uh, that also encrypts their API key as well. Uh, so everything's encrypted using the secret encryption key. When they're uploaded to the server, that's then decrypted. If there's any issues with that, obviously the installation fails, and that actually sends alerting out to you know, your administrators, people that are notified that someone's got a, uh, been trying to install stuff with the, a wrong encryption key or a wrong API key. So this is uh, what I was talking about earlier in terms of stopping rogue DLLs. So this is 
we put this in for a security measure, which was um, to stop people from tampering with packages and saying, go and install this, and it's got some DLLs in that you didn't expect to be there, and they get put in the bin. Um, what it's actually been more useful for is there's been times where we've ended up with wrong versions of system DLLs and stuff that you'd never really want to uh, actually install being sent up to live environments or staging environments or test environments that uh, are the wrong, uh, the wrong version because your dev site's a different version of DNN to the live site because the live site's been updated since you set up your dev site. You've got some references to the, the local bin that uh, either sets a copy local true or that they were at some point and they all get packaged into the, the, uh, the bin folder of the, the install client. And that's entirely stopped that problem from ever happening. Because if it's not referenced in the, the actual manifest of the module, the, you're not going to be uh, putting any of those DLLs in the bin, even if they're in the install package. And as I mentioned, IP whitelisting to ensure that no one's accessing your server with a poly deploy client from somewhere else. Um, we normally say, oh, we've got a shared IP for our office. That's the only IP that we allow on, on live environments, for instance. And auditability. So as I said, any, basically all logs are, are kept for any sort of activity that you, you use with poly deploy. And that's kept in both places. Uh, that's kept in the DNN event log but also a separate poly deploy log because uh, we noticed that one of the things we've seen people do if there is a compromised DNN environment is they go in and they clear down the event log so you can't tell what they've been doing. So we took the, basically thought if we have a separate log then they might not clear two places. It's anything we can do to keep the maximum amount of log in there. There's also plans to put in a notification system at some point if you've got failed API user checks or if you've got uh, failed deployments that those would then be notified to a set of users that you can specify. Uh, but that's on the roadmap, it's not necessarily in the current version. So we should do a bit of a demo. Where's my mouse? I totally lost it. Uh, just. So this is creating a example user in the in the poly deploy uh, API. You've got your APIs and your encryption keys there. If you then navigate away from the page and come back, they're then obfuscated out except for the, for the last couple of characters. Same with the IP whitelist. And that event log's got nothing in it for now. So that's just showing that there's nothing actually installed currently, currently except for the, the poly deploy module. And this is the, the actual uh, installation uh, UI. So we've got a, a contrived example where we've got um, components of a PC um, as modules, uh, we've got your cache, graphic card, uh, so on and so on. They all have interdependencies. Um, these are just example packages that you, we use for testing Polar Deploy to make sure it was all working fine. So you drag and drop upload. Um, and then when we press continue, that will actually upload all those packages and then start off doing all of that uh, dependency uh, analysis and making sure that they're all installed in the right order. So as you can see now, on the installation summa summary, those are actually put in the right order. So you've got the case first, and then the motherboard, and the graphic card, and the hard disk, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that's just to make sure that you, you're installing what you, what you expect, and that it has put them in the, in the right order. I was clearly a bit verbose when I was making this, <laughs> this demo video. So that's starting off the install, and that should be pretty quick. Bam, you've installed all your modules.
Okay, so that's the, that's the integrated method of doing things. There's also the, uh, obviously the, the command line version of it. If I scroll down there. So this is just the, the config file for, uh, for the command line version. Uh, you point it at the site that you want uh, using this uh, target U URL. And then you put, enter in your API and encryption keys for the, uh, for the client that, you, that you'd want. So this is probably going to go away and generate those two uh, keys. I'm scrubbing the video. Yeah. So that, that'll go away. We create a different API user for our deployment clients. We'd normally call it CI or deployment client. Um, and then put those keys into that config file. And then we can run the, de the deployment in the command line window. Should I um, um, turn off the light? Sure. You find it difficult to see that. How's that? So that's just calling the um, calling the client and saying my my modules are here and it will uh, then it encrypts and uploads them and then installs them. And it's simple as that. And if we look in the uh, the logs on the other side, you can see all the package installations there. And that's basically it for the demo. So, oh, that's gone a bit funny. Let's see if I can get that. Ah, that might be because. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Um, so, we've seen deployment times reduced by 50% on average uh, in terms of um, that's overall. So we had customers that had, as I said, 20, 30 modules. 20 minutes of that would be installing modules one at a time. Um, and obviously now we've reduced that to 30, 40 seconds. But it's only 50% on average because you've still got all the config time and, and taking backups and all that, all that stuff. We've had 100% successful deployments since we started rolling this out. We haven't had any deployments that have failed due to um, packages being installed in the wrong order or various different DLLs being uploaded to the server and causing the site to crash. And we've essentially, it's been smooth sailing ever since we started using it. Uh, continuous deployment and testing uh, has probably been the biggest upside for us. So we've got our CI system, we've got the teams of developers whenever any code gets merged into the main development branch, it gets automatically built and then deployed with Polydeploy to a test site and then we run end-to-end -end integration tests on that te test site as soon as it's come back up. So we can essentially, if we're going to have failed uh, code, then we fail really quickly and normally within 20 minutes of the code being checked in, the tests have either passed or failed and everything's happy. So. Uh, we launched this at uh, DNN Summit in February, and it's uh, been on GitHub now for a couple of months. Uh, we've had a, a couple of pull requests from the community. Um, I'd encourage you to go check it out. Uh, it's just at github.com slash Kantaris slash polydeploy. And it's also available uh, through the DNN store uh, for free. So. In terms of the future roadmap, uh, so 
we're looking at IP version 6 because currently it only supports version 4 because it was the easiest to thing to do at the time. Um, forwarded IP whitelists, so we have run into an issue if you're using stuff, something like Cloudflare. Um, getting your actual IP through is all in the X44, which it shouldn't necessarily be trusted for security, so um, we have to circumvent Cloudflare in order to do our deployments, do our deploy, deploy client, um, and we're looking into a fix for that. Uh, scheduled deployments, being able to basically say, I want to deploy all these packages, but I want to do it at this exact time. It would be really useful for clients that, for example, would want, don't want downtime in business hours. They want to do it at 8, 9 o'clock at night. We can just schedule a deployment for that time, and off we go. Version module dependency, so it, it does work out uh, what... Uh, modules depend on each other and install them in the correct order, but it doesn't necessarily um, look at what specific versions of each module each one needs. So there could be a situation where you're depend you depend on the absolute latest version of a package and it just goes, oh, that package is there. We're good to install when actually it, it needs to depend on that specific version. Um, that actually needs a, a pull request to the, the platform because the uh, DNM version dependency is in the manifest, it's just never really looked at anywhere. So um, we're looking at uh, making a pull request to the platform to fix that. And then obfuscation of data ta database tables. So we want to have the IP whitelisting and everyone's API keys. The API keys are already obfuscated, but we want to obfuscate the IP whitelist and everything. So even if someone gets access to the database, they can't see any of the stuff that relates to PolyDeploy from a security point of view. Is that the point for every entry in the database? Because the encryption key, API key, and block, block entries also in the database will they be encrypted too? Because um, if you have an API key and the encryption key and you miss to copy it, you will only see the last four. Yeah, that's I guess. that's by design. So if you if you if you don't copy it, yeah. you have to set up a different user. Yes, I I, I um, connect to the database and copy it from the database directly. And if now they will. Mm -hmm. Obfuscate it, then it's not possible. So then I have to remove it and create a new one. Yeah. Okay. Which version version have you used for the demo? Because um, as I used it last week, it's not possible to uh, use the local host like described to add the new user or mm -hmm. the API key and so on. That's interesting. I did, wasn't aware of the local host issue. Um, the, the version of the demo is the, I think it's version 0.6. It was the one that for the, we were, the initial release we did for DNN Summit. The master branch? Yeah. I, I used the development branch 2 and the master branch, and both it will not work as far as I see. So I have to connect to database and enter the um, IPv4. It does not work, so I enter the IPv6 and it worked. Okay. So then, then it was possible to connect from localhost and enter the IPv4 from our TFS for continuous deployment. Okay. Um, I think if you could raise that issue on GitHub, that'd be really helpful. Yes. Um, and for the roadmap, maybe a, a good future would be for white cards. If you have a level C net, you could just enter a star for the last, for example, if you have. Mm -hmm. um, Rotating IPs for the clients if you want to deploy from a laptop or workstation stuff like that. Yeah, that'd be useful. Yeah. Um, where was I? And enforced HTTPS, which I think is in the pipeline now if it's not been merged in. Um, but I think someone might be actively working on that uh, just to make sure that all traffic goes over HTTPS because obviously um, every, every extra level of security we have is is beneficial to us. Ooh. Okay, so that's been pretty quick, uh, which is always useful for the last talk of the conference. <laughs> um, anyone got any questions? If you're short, if you're, if, uh, if you have some sort of time, that'd be, I'd love to hear if that your CI and your alternate testing and how you manage that. Yeah. Sure. No, we can. Um, so we use, uh, well, for our CI, we use uh, GitLab and GitLab runners. Um, 
so essentially they allow us the flexibility. Uh, essentially, it triggers off a job whenever your, uh, you get merged in. And essentially, it's just like writing PowerShell. So we have PowerShell scripts to uh, build everything. We run it through Sonar Cube to get to highlight any code smells or issues. We run it through static code analysis. And then we poly deploy it out. And then we use a platform co called Cypress, Cypress IO to do our end-to-end -end testing. So Cypress is like a, a, new, um, a new age Selenium. It's been designed from the ground up as a Selenium killer. So it doesn't have quite the same issues that we found with Selenium in terms of having to wait for things to be on the page. It has built-in wait times. Uh, if it can't find an element, it waits for a certain thing, uh, a certain threshold, and then fails. Um, and we've that we tried to use Selenium a couple of times in the past for end-to-end -end testing, and it just it just sucks. So, uh, but Cypress has fixed most of those problems as far as we're concerned. It's also got a, a dashboard um, that's currently in beta where it'll record a video, even if you're doing it headlessly, using Chrome, Chrome Web Runner, and then upload the video so you can see where your test failed. Um, hit, it, you can do screenshot comparison. It's really fully featured. Uh, so that's what we use for our testing. Is it, is it uh, a heavy investment getting started? Somebody who doesn't have any automated testing but is interested in it? No. So I, I got started um, on Cypress a couple of, about eight, nine months ago now, and I was up to, I, 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 because I'm not like fully hands-on anymore, um, I just downloaded it, it's an NPM package, booted it up, wrote a couple of tests on one of our clients, and then showed it off to everyone, and everyone just was like, that's great, and then off we went with it. So it was about half an hour to an hour's work between down, downloading it and reading some of the documentation and getting my first test running, so... How long does it take you to like, like, like test 10 pages on the site? Um, like a form with like five fields, next page, five fields, next page. Yeah, so it's it all in, submit. I think we've got, uh, on one of our clients that are using it most, we've got about 100 tests now, and it runs in about 15 minutes. And how long does it take you to program? Oh, um, not all that long. So I did an a inquiry form was one of the things I tested first, mm -hmm. and that was about half an hour to do some validation rules and just make sure it worked, make sure that it got sent off and that we got a success message. Not that it arrived anywhere, but that we got a success message and then say that it worked. <laughs> so not that long at all. You have a question? Um, yep. Um, if, you do, if you deploy multiple packages, um, does a body deploy then um, send the web request to the web server after each installation? No. To restart the server because I think this you could run into issues if you don't do this because if you do it manually module by module then the, re the, the web server gets restarted after every installation and it could be because the, the feature controllers are only executed on the first request so theoretically module 2 that depends on module 1 um, as a dependency in a way that the feature controller of module one mm -hmm. has to be run before you can install module two. And if you just deploy everything, mm -hmm. then you could run into the issue that you try to deploy module two and the feature controller of module one um, was not executed. So it's just maybe a theoretical issue. I think um, yeah. the tool looks really great. And I think for 99% of the dependencies that you have, it, it, it's great. Mm -hmm. so most of the time it's just I need this DLL in the bin folder or I don't know and I need this yeah tables are also there I think um, where the scripts are and then yeah so it does it manually does uh, uh, a whole lot of the stuff that the DNN in installation does it hooks into the same APIs um, I'm not entirely sure about the feature controller you might be right that might be a theoretical issue um, but we haven't run into it as yet um, maybe you can integrate um, parameter, like saying, okay, do um, trigger um, um, web server rest restart after each um, package deployment. To be 100% sure, this is the same, it's the same process like uh, doing it manually one by one, or one after the other. Mm. Maybe. Um, 
I think you might lose context of where you are because obviously it's, it's just running C sharp, so a byte with DNN. Yeah, so then, yeah, it's getting a bit complicated because pull request then yeah. needs to know okay, I already um, deployed um, the first module, then the web server gets restarted, and then there needs to be some, I don't know, database table mm -hmm. telling pull deploy okay, web server just got restarted, and now you have to, to continue um, the deployment process. Yeah, so th at the moment, it obviously only, only uh, recycles the app pool once after it's uh, installed everything. Uh, what we might do is try and um, recreate an issue where we do re rely on one feature controller having been run before another one and, then, and see if it is an issue, and then we, we can probably deal with it from there if it crops up. But I think that would be... I mean, it's an edge case, I suppose. You could always, if you, if you do run into that issue, Install feature controller one through the installation wizard, and then install the rest of the, the modules through Poly Deploy if that's what you really wanted to do. Um, we don't tend to put that much code in our feature controllers. Um, we find that the the smallest amount of you can get away with in the feature controller is probably for the best. So, anything else? Do you support uh, in the future maybe like rollback scenarios? case something does go wrong? I mean, 100%, it's kind of... Yeah, so we have talked about it, um, and it's something that we would want to put on the roadmap eventually. Um, maybe not in the immediate future, but if we had like a, a rollback button, it automatically takes backups for you, and then does your install, and then you can just roll back the backups. That would be perfect for us, so... And you were mentioning that you have to do an application restart mm -hmm. after installing all the zips. Mm -hmm. Why do you need that? Uh, we need that for the DNN reasons, yeah, essentially. Uh, I was hoping that you found like a niche. That no, we <laughs> couldn't find a niche around it. Um, we did have a version that didn't tr trigger a, a restart, but then we saw issues with up update code not running properly and stuff in the feature controller not running properly. So uh, we have to we have to trigger that restart, unfortunately. But as soon as you put something new into the bin folder, there's a restart. There's a restart anyway, yeah. You cannot do anything against the restart. Mm -hmm. Could you do multiple sites at once? Um, so we have um, a process that installs to multiple sites in one uh, CI script. Um, but it just basically calls poly deploying each of those sites. So for our, um, our modules that we distribute to most of our clients, um, we have different test sites for each of them set up. Uh, and then when you make a change to them, it fires off and deploys it to each site and then runs the same testing suite on all of them to make sure that we haven't broken anything on a particular theme or with a particular configuration. So you can run it on multiple sites. It's just, it's just multiple calls to uh, different sites with PolyDeploy on them. Anything else? Okay. Uh, early beer. <laughs>